Hello, art historians, and welcome to the second part of our lecture over oceanic art. Now, in the first lecture that we looked at over this topic of oceanic art, um, I was really talking about at the end of that how, just like in other cultures that we have looked at, a great deal of the works of art that come from areas like Oceania and Africa have a religious function. So that can be anywhere from communicating with ancestors, that can be at funerals, um, that can be in worship or fertility, or allowing somebody the ability to tap into a particular spirit. We've seen this with the transformation masks, and we've seen it in Africa with things like the um, power figure. So it's also gonna be the same in Oceania. And we do see that there is a great deal of art that is also created in conjunction with, you know, making that connection between this world and the next. And to many cultures, um, death and funerals and that funerary process is a really big part of making that transition into the next world and making sure that spirits and ancestors get to where they need to go. So in Papua New Guinea, they do something called the Malagan Mortuary Cer Ceremony. So if you need a way to remember that, put the M's together, that Malagan is mortuary and mortuary has to do with funerary or burial. And they would conduct, after somebody died, these very, very elaborate um, ceremonies to make sure that the soul of the deceased gets to where it needs to go, all right? And in order to do that, they create several things, all right? So one is they would have these huts that they would create for these rituals and for these funerary feasts where they would put statues on the, si on the inside that had very vertical axis running through them and they're balanced on each side. So kind of like this balance between this world and the next world. And then there would also be these funerary masks, all right, that you're kind of looking at here. Remember masks are a part of Native American and also African art and they're meant to be used not just for observation, but they're meant to be used in a particular ceremony, they're very active. So these particular Malagan death masks that are created are incredibly intricate. Um, they take a long time to make and they are very, very just like we looked at with the Ahu'ula um, feather cape from um, Hawaii, these are custom made. None of them are meant to look the same in terms of the families that use them. And they are very, very unique to that particular family. And sometimes, these are so expensive and so time consuming to make that they would be number one made long before a death took place um, or even the funerals would be you know taking place long after these could be made or they would save them for whenever several deaths took place at the same time because they were so expensive but they were such an important part of this so what these masks represent is the relationship of the figures, so the people and the ancestors. So it, like, it's kind of recognizable for those ancestors to know, okay, this is my family because of the markings that are on this particular mask. Now, just like we saw with African masks, these are not meant to be representational. They're not meant to be like the exact replica, like a death mask that would form to the face of the person and kind of depict their actual visage. It's more about the idea of a life force and the transfer of that life force or that mana into the next place that it needs to be. But they're recognizable because the hairstyles do look the same. So again, very, very unique, almost copyrighted. In fact, that this belongs to this family, but some common denominators in there, kind of like we saw with the dope um, uh, portrait figures in Africa. So you can see that the colors you see that red and that yellow, those red and yellow colors are extremely powerful. They're power colors. Like if you're going into a, you know important meeting, you wear a red tie or a red power suit. And then of course there's you know the black that can be warfare or violence, or it can also be um, you know depicting the void between this life and the next one. But these colors are very significant in, in terms of oceanic cultures, especially. So this is the Malagan display, as you guys can see right here. So it's not just the masks. There's several parts of this. So after the ceremonies, they would put the masks kind of in here. And you'll notice that everything here is degradable. Like it can be broken down or it can be destroyed because they that was part of this, that after the soul has gone to where it needs to be, these things are either left to rot or destroyed, just like the body is destroyed and it rots just like after we die, but the soul is gone. 
all right? The masks sometimes can be preserved because they could be used for later funerals, but the rest of it was meant to be destroyed and taken down. This is just a better zoomed in picture. And you can see that they're designed with this pole running through it, that they're identical on each side. It's that contour rivalry, kind of like we saw in um, the Incan cultures or the Shavin. Right, you can see the pictures of them taking place in the ceremony and the rustling of the leaves would create that sound. So kind of like the swishing or the whirring. And of course the feathers would probably move a little bit. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is it would be kind of common sense to think like, okay, on islands, especially if it's not a very big island, there wouldn't be the materials that you would need to create very large scale architecture. Um, but that's actually not the case. And I think it could be argued that some of the architecture that is created in Oceania is actually even more impressive because of the ingenuity they had to actually create these. So one example of this that shows that there were social hierarchies, just like we've seen in other places in the world, is a place called Nanmadal, all right? And Nanmadal is actually this incredible structure that was created basically on a set of islands um, kind of along a coral reef. And what is really neat about it is because it was sitting on these man-made islands and on this kind of coral reef is the water would kind of rush in and wash out almost like a natural sewage system um, that would run through it at the time. And we know that this is definitely a very high status place because of the tombs that have been found there and the remnants of food and things like that that would have been for somebody of upper class, right? Um, so this was actually built by a Saudelaire dynasty. So you've got a ruling family that is going to continue to live here and use this as the seat of power. Like, its location and the way it's built shows that this was a pretty impressive family. And just to give you a time frame, um, they say it would have been built around the same time as Angkor Wat or Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, what is really interesting about this is we do know that it was almost like the Palace of Versailles, where this was a place you had to come um, if you were, you know, a subject of this dynasty, so that you could see how impressive they were. They wanted you to come and be impressed at the magnitude and the ingenuity and the ability and the wealth so that you would go back and tell people like our ruling dynasty is incredibly powerful. They call it the Venice of the Pacific, which I think is a really cool analogy for it because the water in v Venice is actually the canals that run through it and the islands that run through it um, is kind of the same because water and canals kind of run through this as well. So there's 92 artificial islands built onto a coral reef and connected by these different canals, like you kind of see in Venice. Um, it's smaller than New York City. Um, it's only 170 acres, but that's still pretty impressive if you're creating artificial islands. And one of the neat things about it is the walls are kind of designed to curve upward a little bit, kind of like the hull of a boat, because you know on an island culture, boats are very important. So this kind of mimics that. So you can see here um, one of the canals that's running through it. And it's actually really neat that they chose basalt to create this. And basalt actually as a material cuts off very evenly. So it can be cut pretty evenly in like these cylindrical shapes that could be used to build this. So it is pretty good engineering on their part. You can kind of see an aerial view here of the different islands. And here you can see a really good view of the cylindrical, like so the cylinders, the round parts um, that could be easily used to like, you know, cut. Like you can see they're pretty well cut off and making kind of like this, not quite ashlar masonry, like not that smooth, not like Cori Concha and the Inca civilization, but still pretty flat, all right, pretty even, pretty smooth. And then that upward kind of curve on the buildings, all right? So Nanmadal, and you can see kind of a map of it here, is made of megalithic structures, like very big rocks made of that basalt that I told you, that's volcanic rock that can break off very clean, right? So like a very clean cut on it. So it's very precise. And the very center of it was the royal mortuary, which is definitely understandable because that's where your you know, ancestors are going to be. That's where you're going to honor them very similar kind of to the forbidden city in china where they would have their ancestors towards the wedding sun, what the setting sun on the western side and it was meant to be 
very, very intimidating that they were able to kind of conquer nature, you know, in order to create this. Like they were able to subdue everything. And it was must have been one major undertaking because some of these rocks came from as far as 25 miles away, like Stonehenge. You know it's important the harder it is to make. And this was probably very, very difficult. All right, so that's the end of our oceanic art. Um, and in our next unit, we're going to be moving back to Europe to finish our year with 20th century art and global contemporary.